Make a note of this somewhere in your Bible. This will be helpful, or at least in your material. Chapter 4 begins the first major section of Ezekiel. The first lengthy section. Chapters 4 through 24 are about God's judgment against Judah, the reasons why Babylonian judgment is coming. Uh, so this is the, the, the first section of the book, chapters 1 through 3, as, as we've studied, is, is about Ezekiel's call and, and his, um, uh, his, his mission. But th this is the first major section. Chapters 4 through 24 are all about Judah and the reasons that God is judging them, okay? So make a note of that somewhere uh, in your Bible or in your material. Now, where did we leave off? on Sunday at the end of chapter 3. So God has pretty well told Ezekiel, this is what you're supposed to do. Uh, let, let's just do this by, real quick by way of review. What year did God speak to Ezekiel to call him to be a prophet? 590. <laughs> okay, okay, hold on, wait. What year, what year was Ezekiel carried off into captivity? 597. Okay, what year was he called to be a prophet? 593. Okay, good. Chapter 1, verse 2, in the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's exile. So that's 593. All right. You're going to go, you're going to preach to the people, the exiles, okay? Um, how well... Are they going to listen? They're not. In fact, God says they're, they are so rebellious and so stubborn that I tell you what, Ezekiel, I'm going to make you more stubborn than they are. I'm going to make your head harder than theirs so that when you butt heads with these people, you're going to come out on top. Okay? You're going to uh, remember some of the things God told him. You're going to sit on scorpions, thorns and thistles you're going to have to deal with. Uh, this is not the kind of task that uh, a preacher who is searching uh, for a, a work uh, is, is going to be interested in. And then at the end of chapter 3, something kind of interesting happens. God's been saying to Ezekiel, go preach, go preach, go preach. And then he says, I'm going to lock you up inside your house. And we said that that doesn't mean he never went outside. It just means he was not able to interact with the people in the way that he ordinarily would. He probably spent the bulk of his time in his house. What was the next thing God said that, that the people would do to him? They would put what around him? Ropes or bands? Yeah, cords, and they would tie him. And, and again, we said that there, there's no indication in the book that the people ever actually did that, literally. But um, maybe it's a figurative expression, meaning because of their rebellion, and the fact that they were just so unwilling to listen, they virtually tied his own hands. They tied Ezekiel's hands and made him unable to be effective, uh, much as the people in Nazareth did to Jesus in Mark chapter 6. And then the last thing, what did God say he was going to do to Ezekiel's tongue? Close it, make it stick to the roof of his mouth. And he said, you will only speak when what? I tell you, you will only speak when I give you a message to speak. So again... Um, it, it doesn't mean Ezekiel was silent for seven years, which is how long God uh, closed his mouth. It doesn't mean he never made a sound for seven years. It just means that he was not at liberty to speak in the way that he normally would. And so he would, he would only speak when God gave him something to say. Uh, that, that is to the people. All right. So that brings us into chapter four. The year is still 593 which means Jerusalem is still standing, okay? It has not fallen yet. What year does Jerusalem finally fall? 586, okay? Yeah, so we've got another seven years until Jerusalem falls, okay? All right, so it starts in chapter 4 and verse 1. Now you, son of man, get yourself a brick, place it before you, and inscribe a city on it, Jerusalem. Then lay siege against it, build a siege wall, raise up a ramp, pitch camps, and place battering rams against it all around. Then get yourself an iron plate and set it up as an iron wall between you and the city, and set your face toward it so that it is under siege and besiege it. This is a sign to the house of Israel. All right, let's not spend too much time on this because I think this me the meaning of this is actually pretty clear. What is God 
showing the people through this sign that he calls Ezekiel to display? I'm sorry? All right, and what's going to happen because of that? All right, destruction is coming, and I really mean it, okay? So Ezekiel goes and he gets a brick, um, and, and, it, and it, apparently it's still a, a brick that's got enough softness in it that he can kind of carve into it and inscribe on it. And he inscribes the city of Jerusalem. And he sets up kind of this model city, basically. Uh, and, and outside the city, there are uh, camps and encampments of armies that are set up around it. So, you know, a lot of times architects do this, engineering firms will do this. When they're going to build some big structure in a new city, they'll build a model of it that's very, very small just to show you what it's going to look like on that scale. And that's what Ezekiel does with Jerusalem. And then he gets this iron plate or this, uh, this griddle, uh, maybe some of your translations say, what you'd cook pancakes on, all right? So he goes up to the... Um, uh, what, what, what's the, the old cook stove, you know, the granny clampets, he gets her iron griddle, and uh, he places that between himself and this brick, or this model city of Jerusalem. And what does that, uh, well, first of all, what, what does that mean? What, what, is that, what, what does that uh, symbolize? Okay, think, all right. Now, what, what, what is Ezekiel going to do with this iron... Uh, iron pan. I'm sorry. Oh, you guys are overthinking this. What 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 did ancient um, military people build their weapons out of? Metal, iron. Yeah. All right. Th th this is this is symbolic of, of of Babylonian forces that are coming in, and and they're not just coming in with um, you know uh, the. They're not just coming in shooting spit wads, all right? They're, they're bringing the real stuff. They're, it's iron. It, it's, it's hard. It's heavy. It, it's, it's big, powerful, all right? Uh, iron is, is that, that really strong metal, and, and the, the idea is the forces that come upon you, they're the real thing, and, and this is really going to happen, okay? All right. Um, so here's one other thing I want us to see from, from this first sign that he gives them that I think is important. You'll remember in one of our first lessons, we talked about the purposes of Ezekiel's preaching. We said there were four purposes, and the very first one was to shatter any hopes that the people had of going back to Jerusalem. You remember that? All right, here's one of the ways that Ezekiel does that. Jerusalem, the city that you love, the city that you long to go back to, it's about to be demolished. And so he's trying to to point their hopes and dreams away from Jerusalem surviving. It's not going to, okay? All right, let's keep reading. Verse five, or verse four, excuse me. As for you, lie down on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel on it. You shall bear their iniquity for the number of days that you lie on it. For I have assigned you a number of days corresponding to the years of their iniquity. 390 days, thus you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. So lay down on your left side for 390 days. And what do those days correspond to? 390 years of what? The iniquity of the people of Israel. Okay, good. All right, now, verse 6. When you have completed these, you shall lie down a second time, but on your right side, and bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. I have assigned it to you for 40 days, a day for each year. Then you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem with your arm bared and prophesy against it. With your arm bared. Um, if, you, if you're working outside, you, we talk about rolling up your sleeves, right? All right. What does that mean? You're ready to work. You're, you're ready to show your strength, okay? And so he says, Ezekiel, the siege of the city, you bear your arm. The, the siege is coming. The strength of Babylon is coming. Now, verse, verse 8, uh, Behold, I will put ropes on you so that you cannot turn from one side to the other until you've completed the days of your siege. I could spend the whole class period talking about this segment. I don't need to do that. Um, I have a lot of things to say about this, but I'm going to try to be uh, selective this is not really a second sign, it seems, as much as it is a continuation of the previous one about the brick. Um, so in verse, uh, excuse me, in, in these verses, Ezekiel's going to lie on his left side 390 days, and then on his right side for 40 days. You add the two together and you get 
430 days or 430 years. Now, in this text, it is explicitly stated one year equals one day. All right, verse 5 brings that out very clearly. You lay for this number of days corresponding to the years. Not every time in Scripture are days and years correlated like this. They are a few times uh, that we know because it's explicitly stated. For instance, there's, there's one example that we all know of, but we may just not be coming to mind right now. Uh, when they sent the 12 spies into the land, how many days did they go and spy out the land? 40 days, right? And then when the people of Israel didn't have faith, how long did they wander in the wilderness? All right, one year corresponding to each day. All right, well, here it's in reverse. It's one day corresponding to each year. So 430 years, 430 days. Ezekiel's going to lie on his sides for a total of 430 days. Now, the question that everybody is asking is, did he really do that? <laughs> did he lie there on his sides for, what is that, a year and a third or something? I mean, did, did he really do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Most likely, no. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one is very practical. What does he do when he's got to go to the bathroom? What does he do when he's, when he's hungry and he's got to eat something? Now, we're going to talk about what he'll eat in just a moment, uh, but I don't think that was his only diet, that bread that he made. Um, but the more scripturally based reason to think that he did not literally lie there on his sides for 24 hours a day uh, for 430 days, if you look at chapter 8 and verse 1, Ezekiel receives his second Vision. This is the second time God comes to him. And I'm, I'm not going to try to do the math with you. I'm just going to ask you to trust me on this. But the date at which he receives this vision in chapter 8 and verse 1 is less than 430 days from the time he received the first vision that we're talking about now. And if you look at chapter 8 and verse 1, it says that Ezekiel was sitting in his house with the elders of Judah who were also sitting there with him. He's not lying down. And so this is about 410 days later, roughly, and instead of lying down, he's actually sitting up. So I think that indicates, no, he did not literally lie down for 430 days, 24 hours. I mean, think about it, bed sores and, you know, think about all that, okay? But I do think it does mean he literally did lie down for 430 days. I just don't think it means he did it for 24 hours a day. I think he would lie down for a portion of every day for 430 days. That's kind of the uh, best conclusion I've been able to reach. So what times would he do that? Well, whatever the busiest times of the day were. Because what is this again? It's a sign that the people are supposed to see. And so he's going to be doing this not in the middle of the night. We're not talking about him sleeping. We're talking about this is happening during the middle of the day when all the people are there and they see what he's doing. And you got, they're thinking, well, what, what is this? He's sure is acting strange. What's he doing? Well, he's displaying. He's, he's giving them a sign, okay? You have a question? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Well, but, okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Arlene said, I thought he was locked up in his house. Well, he is, but were you here Sunday? We talked about that briefly a little bit. And just as a reminder, we said that that doesn't mean he never went outside. Um, so there would have been times where he, he did. Uh, but again, uh, ch chapter 8, verse 1, it talks about the elders coming to his house uh, to, to speak with him. So it, it seems like Ezekiel may be doing a little bit of both. But wherever he is, he's publicly visible. Even if he's in his house, he could still be publicly visible. Uh, in, in Well, not in our houses today because we have curtains. But uh, and, and this is a different time, so I'm sure he was a little bit more visible than, than we would be inside our houses. Um, I don't know if that helps at all, but that's the, it, it is tough to, to make sense of that. But that's the best way I've been able to, to grasp it. Um, we'll... we'll if I can remember, I'll come back to that in, in just a moment with another sign that, that we see here. Okay, now, this is the really hard part of this for me. 
how are we supposed to understand this 430 year business? Um, there are some people who would say, this is a literal period of 430 years and it corresponds exactly to Israel's history. So there are two points in time, a beginning and an end. The distance between the two is 430 years and that's what God's talking about. The difficulty with that is nobody knows where to start counting the 430 years. Nobody knows where to stop. Do you start at 586 and work backwards? If you do, you end up with a date that in Israelite history is meaningless. It has no significance to it. Do you start with 722 when the northern kingdom was carried off by Assyria and subtract 430? If you do, you end up with like 270 BC, which is a date of no significance. Nobody seems to know where to begin or end the counting of the 430 years. So it's really hard for me to see this as a representation of a true 430 year time period with those definite beginnings and, and end points, okay? Somebody else comes along and says, no, 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 this is just figurative and all it means is a really long time. I don't think verse five allows that because he explicitly says the day equals the year. One day for one year. God has a definite time frame in mind. So I don't think just chalking it up and saying, well, just figurative for a long period of time is going to work either. Let me show you something that I think is interesting. Go back to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus 12. Now, if we're in the book of Exodus, what's going on here? And I'm talking just very large scale view. What, what's going on in this book? Where's Israel at the beginning of the book? Captivity in Egypt, all right? And this is, of course, the Exodus, how they come out of that captivity. If you look at chapter 12 and verse 40, now this is in, in the context of, of the Passover and, and the people are about to leave Egypt. Now, verse 40, the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. And at the end of 430 years to the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. All right. The number 430 is a significant number in the minds of the Jews for this reason. That's how long their ancestors spent in captivity. What is it that the Jews in Ezekiel's day are facing? Captivity. Okay. So when Ezekiel comes along and he says 430, 430, 430, what, what's going off in the minds of the Jews? Egypt, <laughs> Egypt, bondage, bondage, okay? Um, there are numbers in the scriptures that are significant numbers. We mentioned the number 40 uh, already, 40 days, 40 nights. How many times do we see that in the scriptures? Um, there are significant numbers in the scriptures. And in the minds of the Jews, 430 was a significant number. Let's go to another prophet. Let me show you something that might help us put this together. Go to Hosea chapter 8. Hosea, okay, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, all right? Hosea chapter eight, let's look at this. This is interesting because in Hosea chapter eight, now, uh, this is a pop quiz bonus question. Hosea was a prophet to which kingdom? North or south? North, okay, good, northern kingdom. And so this is before the northern kingdom of Israel falls to Assyria in 722. Now look at chapter 8 and verse 13. As for my sacrificial gifts, they sacrifice the flesh and eat it, but the Lord has taken no delight in them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish them for their sins. They will return to... Well, now wait a minute. The, the northern kingdom is going to be carried off into captivity in Egypt? No. Egypt here is figurative for Assyria. How do I know that? Look at chapter 9 and verse 3. They will not remain in the Lord's land, but Ephraim will return to Egypt, and in Assyria they will eat unclean food. Uh, food. Who was the nation that actually carried off Israel into captivity? It was Assyria. But Hosea said Egypt. Does that seem strange? It seems strange, but what did the word Egypt mean to the Jews? Bondage, bondage, bondage. And so Ezekiel comes along and he says, 390 plus, plus 40, 430, bondage. That's what awaits us, okay? 
that view is the one that I'm currently the most satisfied with in terms of this 430 business. However, I do that with reservations. It has its faults too, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. <laughs> no, I, I will tell you. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 4, and I'll, I'll, I will tell you what, the, uh, what my reservation is about this view, although I do think it's the best one that I can wrap my head around for now. Verse 5, chapter 4. I have assigned to you a number of days corresponding to the years of their iniquity. The years of their iniquity, not the years of their captivity in Egypt. So when it says the years of their iniquity, that kind of indicates uh, a period of time where the people were sinning against God, and that would not be the case of the nation of Israel while they were in bondage in Egypt. That's the reservation that I have with that. Uh, but for now, again, that's the best explanation that I can give to this. So, any questions or comments? I know that was like, I didn't expect any of that. Ken? Yes. Right. Yes. All right. Chapter 3, verse 25, who's putting the, the, the ropes on Ezekiel? The people. They will do this, presumably the people. Chapter 4 and verse 8, God says, I'm going to put ropes on you. I'm going to put uh, bindings on you. I think the idea is if we, I, I, I'll grant, it could be literal. It, it really could. Um, I, I'm sorry? No, no question, no question. Um, I, I think you're going to have a hard time explaining, though, if, if we interpret that literally, that God literally put ropes around Ezekiel, I think we're going to have a hard time explaining some of those things that I pointed out earlier about, you know, how, how is it that he's up and moving about within this 430-day time period? Uh, how is it that, um, as we're going to see in the next chapter, you know, he, he, he shaves his head and, and walks around the city and scatters the hair? How does he do that if he literally has these ropes? So I'm inclined to think that, that, that they're both figurative. And, but the idea of them is the same. The people are going to tie Ezekiel's hands by not listening to him and keeping his preaching from being successful. God is going to restrict Ezekiel in the sense that what's the only thing that God says you're going to be able to speak according to the last part of chapter 3? What I tell you. And so, Ezekiel, I'm putting restrictions on you. You can't just go out and say whatever you want to say. You only speak what I give you. And in that sense, God puts ropes on him. That may not be satisfactory for some, but uh, again, that's, that's the best way that I can see this right now. I'm sorry? Yes, yes, that, that's right. Um, okay, chapter 4, verse 9. But as for you, take wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and spelt, and put them in one vessel and make them into bread for yourself. You shall eat it according to the number of the days that you lie on your side, 390 days, or on your left side. Your food which you shall eat shall be 20 shekels a day by weight, and you shall eat it from time to time. The water you drink shall be the sixth part or one-sixth of a hen by measure. You shall drink it from time to time. You shall eat it as a barley cake, having baked it in their sight over... Then the Lord said, Thus will the sons of Israel eat their bread unclean among the nations where I will banish them. Don't turn back to it, but we actually read something very similar in that Hosea 9 verse 3 passage where uh, he said, in Assyria, they will eat unclean bread. And it's very similar to what we see here in Ezekiel chapter 4. All right, several things about this. What is the significance of Ezekiel taking these multiple ingredients, combining them to make bread? He's got, you know, wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, spelt. Well, what's the significance of that? The famine. Okay, elaborate. Yes, 
Yes, they are scraping the bottom of every barrel they can find. And, and so there's not enough wheat in the harvest to make bread out of only wheat. There's not enough barley to make single ingredient barley bread. What you're doing is, we call it the kitchen sink. You throw everything that you've got into the pot and you make soup. You just empty your refrigerator so stuff doesn't go bad and you make your soup, all right? And Ezekiel is going around and he's taking all the ingredients, the very last part of the barrel, bringing it all together to try to make a bread out of these ingredients. Symbolic of how bad the famine is going to be when Babylon is sieging Jerusalem and not letting anything in or out of the city. All right. Uh, verses 10 and 11, his food and his water are measured and rationed. He gets food 20 shekels a day, which amounts in modern equivalents to about eight ounces of food. So he gets about one cup of food a day. And his water, one-sixth of a hen, uh, you ladies have that on your measuring cups, don't you? Uh, that's about two-thirds of a quart, okay, if that, if that helps you see, two-thirds of a quart. That that rationing and, and that idea, it, it, it displays again how bad things are going to be during the siege. If you drop down to verses 16 and 17, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, behold, I'm going to break the staff of bread in Jerusalem, and they will eat bread by weight with anxiety and drink water by measure and in horror, because bread and water will be scarce, and they will be appalled with one another and waste away in their iniquity. So what Ezekiel does by measuring and rationing his food and water, God says that's exactly what the people are going to do when Nebuchadnezzar comes and he lays siege to the city. Verses 12 and 13, he's going to bake his bread over human feces. <laughs> I don't know who did that. But <laughs> All right. Um, Ezekiel objects to this. No, Lord. Why does he object? It's unclean. And what does Ezekiel care if it's clean or unclean? What's his job, by the way? Priest. Yeah, priests had very specific laws about what could and could not go in their mouths, right? And Ezekiel says, my throat has never touched anything that was unclean. I am not going to eat bread that's cooked over this unclean substance. Now, cooking over feces is not all that uncommon. It is in the United States. But uh, in other parts of the world, they will take animal dung and they will use it as fuel. That's actually pretty normal. And uh, it was normal back in this time. But it was not normal to use human dung. Now, don't you think God knew that human feces was unclean? Why does he suggest that to Ezekiel in the first place? Is there anything that maybe God is, is hinting at with that suggestion? The animals are all gone? <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. Oh, well, yeah, that, that's, that's true. That's true, but God does give him cow dung, so at least the cows are still out there grazing. So, <laughs> all right. Todd. Yes, yes, exactly. It, it, it displays how unclean the people are. To say to Ezekiel, I'm going to make you cook your food over this unclean source of fuel, it, it's, it's indicative of how, how sinful and wicked the people are. Um, okay. So God accommodates his request in verse 15. He gives him that cow dung and uh, he says, you know, see, I I've given you that in place of human dung over which to prepare your bread. Now, imagine that you are one of the Jewish exiles and you're watching Ezekiel day after day and he's doing all this weird stuff. He's lying down for days on end. He's eating bread that's made out of... And, and remember, that's not their situation in Babylon, right? Right? They got it pretty good in Babylon. They, they're eating wheat bread. Um, th they got it pretty good. Ezekiel is doing these signs about where? Jerusalem. And so if you're in Babylon and you're doing okay, remember the letter Jeremiah wrote? Plant vineyards, build your houses, get married, have kids, have grandkids. Things are pretty good in Babylon. And here's Ezekiel living like a caveman who's cooking his food over human or, or over, over feces and, you know, can you imagine just being one of these Jewish exiles watching me like, hey, Ezekiel, man, we, we got some wood out here, man, if you want. Like, we can help you with that. Why are you eating? Hey, I, I, got, I, I just made a Reuben sandwich a minute ago. You want some of my bread? 
But what is Ezekiel doing? He's signifying what's going... He's, he is a living illustration. 